parties for the introduction. Um, I just want to use, uh, use one sentence to summarize all my uh, all our parties that uh, we are living in a world that uh, that change uh, that changes in very rapid manner. So we need uh, C uh, uh, C C R C R N A. That is called con uh, continuous risk monitoring and assessment uh, and, and assessment. For this for these things, I. I remember, I remember that uh, in 2008, uh, September 20, the uh, Lehman, Bro Lehman Brother uh, bankrupt, bankrupt, uh, bankrupt. But in that time, in that morning, my cousin uh, who works for the Taiwanese bank, in that morning, that before uh, before before the uh, before the stock price uh, instant, instantly drops, they still they still sell their big uh, products to Taiwanese bank. And Taiwan is back in that time they don't know they don't know the bankruptcy uh, the bankruptcy news. Um, I think in that time if uh, if uh, if the bank system use uh, uh, maybe that like continuous monitoring system, they, they do very good uh, they, they do very all this uh, assurance, they can avoid that uh, that big trouble and they don't they, they won't buy that that uh, trash trash debt or trash trash products. And another example is uh, why we need a continuous uh, monitoring. Uh, 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 this one continuous risk, con continuous, continuous risk monitoring or assessment, or continuous uh, continuous uh, continuous control monitoring, uh, uh, and or uh, CDA the continuous data assessment. The other the, the other example is that like this year, uh, 2016, the uh, Note Seven. I mean Samsung Note Seven. The notes, uh, the note cell phone. If, if the Samsung uh, know know the uh, their their phone problem, like uh, specific some problem, like they they can they can uh, they can get the feedback from from customer. They know the they know the key problems of phone. They can uh, if they uh, call back the their products in very early, early time, they can avoid a lot a lot of decrease or a lot of. Uh, um, and maybe the, the decrease of their uh, the, the money or their um, uh, their uh, this these terrible things in that time. So I mean, in this uh, I, I mean, like uh, from uh, like Samsung, in that in I mean uh, like January August, they cannot predict this incident. They only pre they 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 only pre they only they only happen they only fo uh, focus on this incident coming like just maybe September or October they finally figure out, but they can't they, they cannot figure out or predict in January because every every in that time every company they don't want to burn burn their customers <laughs> they don't want to produce some uh, products to burn their customers, but if, if they can if they can know if they can know immediately if they can know maybe that just one week earlier or two weeks earlier, they can uh, they can uh, they can reverse and they can predict these things and they can uh, finally uh, pre uh, prevent avoid this uh, this incident happening. So uh, so in this time we need a continuous uh, continuous continuous uh, control uh, continuous con uh, continuous continuous monitoring and continuous. Data assurance and for this uh, uh, this uh, this amazing system CR CR and MMA. So that is why why we need this system. And for the overview, uh, is it also also talked about? We need uh, we need the three key system integrated together. That can leverage the whole. Uh, they can leverage this system and they uh, they can they can build a strong system. Uh, based on the three systems integrated, integrated perfectly. And the next part is narrow. Oh, yeah. yes. okay. Good morning. Um, now I'm going to talk about the um, uh, continuous risk monitoring and assessment process. Um, Professor Wazirheli and uh, his team um, proposed uh, three different uh, general types of uh, uh, continuous monitoring risk and uh, assessment uh, risks. Uh, for framework, uh, the first uh, risk is the business process and or operational 
risk. This, uh, this kind of risk is um, internal, inherent, uh, attributable to business itself and its industry, all uh, internal um, risk related to uh, the business and uh, its uh, subsidiaries and any process. process. And the second type uh, of risk is uh, environmental risk. It includes, includes um, other um, forces in the internal environment uh, such as uh, infrastructure and information security uh, issues. And the uh, macro environmental uh, risk uh, include, uh, includes political risk and uh, competitors risk and risks in um, economic uh, arenas. So the third risk is um, black swan. So the black swan risk is a very low profitable um, of transpiring, but uh, would likely carry substantial cost in materialized. Um, the black swan events are typically random and unexpected and ex external difficult to, really difficult to uh, predict. So that's, and this is a illustrated uh, the black swan event as um, <coughs> airplane hijacking that arises issue of sudden, sudden uh, unavailable uh, prolonged jet fuel. Um, this kind of situ situation should be planned, planned complemented, uh, uh, contemplated and extensive feasible. So, but, um, so it's important to have all businesses uh, have a, on mechanism for those kind of risk to monitor and accumulate and maintain information. So, and um, after all that risk identified, um, businesses have to um, have to um, collect all the information, um, risk profile, uh, effective monitoring, which is holds uh, key risk indicators, key R R I. Um, it uh, constructed along with associated um, uh, benchmark or collected uh, benchmark sets into the profile and performance a systematic uh, continuous manner. So this um, the key risk indicator um, measures indicative emerging problems and associated accounts and transactions identified in vulnerable business areas and updated uh, audit plans and revised set of audit procedures and tests uh, complied for execution. So uh, in order to complete um, uh, continued risk uh, monitoring assessment framework, maintain develop um, key risk indicators set and then um, uh, find out new measures and refine the existing metrics and delete and scale of uh, all the um, key are, uh, indicators and uh, indicators. So now Lichi is going to talk about a specific, a specific uh, consideration in implementing a continuous risk of monitoring assessment. Okay. Uh, I'll do one. I will give you some specific details about this. that reflects 
the risk checks to help the uh, management to take immediate action. A specific case such as the loss per rate of billion dollar the incident of each million cases of future transactions accounting for the proportion of total transactions that a turnover and so on. In my opinion, the core of the PRA advice in its ability to represent change in a particular risk area. If we could establish a corresponding the indicator of the risk area, so these indicators could serve as early warning signals and they reflect the risk change and can be used to monitor the risk that may cause operational risk loss. Uh, well, management can quickly take measures to control and respond to these uh, risk based on the chains in, in them. And the risk events may have a variety of causes. So the PR is a very important tool to uh, manage the key risk causes of risk events. Um, generally, we have to analyze the key risk and the key causes of these uh, risk events. And then we have to qualify the key courses to put them in a determine their merits and determine the specific values of the courses. And then we can, based on these values, or to pass or subtract uh, some relevant values to come from a new value list. New value is called the key risk indicators. And uh, which the so in this case we could establish a risk. Uh, warning system. That is when the key factor reaches the key indicator, the system will send out a warning message to establish the process of risk of warning system. In my opinion, since the complexity and diversity of oper operational risk, it is difficult to have a tool or method that is completely effective. Therefore, we should uh, set a major goal of the KRIs. Set up. So most important is that indicators should be risk sensitive and to reflect change in the risk factors that lead to loss. It is clear that the role of AI is not predict operational risk, but it is more like the monitoring the operational risk situation and its checks. So in essence, the change in the AI indicator value is not predicting whether the type, a certain type of risk. Uh, the events will occur, and which is impossible, uh, but whether the level of the operational risk and uh, about this, with this risk the rising or falling, some change about the risk. The PRI approach can apply to multiple areas, so we can manage monitor key potential indicators for individual risks, as well as manage multiple dangerous risks that affect about the business uh, transaction or primary goal course. The business parameters. So even the KRI technique uh, doesn't have been used widely, but I believe that mm -hmm. the KRI have a full developed uh, space in the future. Yes. Uh, my part, uh, my next part is auditor and management response to change risk levels. Uh, the CRI is a one page of organizations integrated and automated IT structures to monitor current business operations data. And both management and auditors are provided with relevant, comprehensive, and up-to-date uh, risk information. And the auditors response, uh, overall responses uh, uh, to adjust the change, change to assess the risk levels may of the several misstatements may include uh, uh, emphasizing the auditor team the need to maintain the uh, professional skepticism in gathering and evaluating the uh, audit evidence, assigning more uh, experienced the staff or those with specialist skills or using specialists, uh, providing more supervision or or incorporating additional elements of unpredictability in the selection of further audit procedures to be performed. In addition, the auditor may make general changes to 
the time, uh, the nature of uh, timing is dependent on the words of uh, audit procedures and the overall response. For example, performing the uh, performing the substantive procedure at the at the period end instead of the interim at the interim date. And the application of PRS uh, dashboard system facilitates monitoring the organization's risk expo exposure levels and the complements are the uh, risk management tools for an uh, effective interpretation to other uh, risk management process such as ERM. Uh, many organizations have adopted the uh, ERM uh, to improve their risk uh, management practices. Such initiatives uh, in building an uh, effective risk ma management and, and the enhancing corporate uh, government governance of the as an opportunity to broaden the traditional control controls driven internal audit activities. Um, as I said, the, uh, the CRM system helps uh, auditors and uh, management to improve their work. There is a hypothetical illustration. Uh, there is the uh, company named uh, Maxi Models, it's the uh, automobile company. And it has the uh, CRM system that is related to regulatory environment uh, of the auto emission standards. So. One day, the CRM system suddenly uh, gives a, an alert that there is a significant uh, business risk. And the, this is reported by CRM, the reporting module in this company. And soon, the management picks up a strategic response uh, to a arrange the R&D expenditures to focus more on environmentally friendly vehicles such as electricity and uh, hybrid. So, and not only uh, it helps uh, management, it also helps auditors. Auditors are also important with the CIMA information, so they can adjust the uh, audit plans. And uh, more importantly, they notice the pressure uh, on the R&D structure and the uh, short-term earnings. So they may, uh, so management may be, uh, maybe may manipulate the earnings between the short-term earnings target. And so this, uh, the transactions and accounts related to IMT expenses and the uh, earnings accounts may be, uh, may be risk. Uh, so it needs more uh, audit procedures to audit. So in this case, the management uh, take action plans to address the uh, carbon and the auditors adjust the plan to improve the audit companies. So they, they are all benefits from they all benefit from the CRMA system. And then Matt will talk about how CRMA uh, evaluates the material mistake. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as we all know, uh, one of the primary jobs of an auditor is to is evaluate the risk of material misstatement. Uh, one of the trade-offs that is made in the auditing standards is that uh, every business is different and unique. So if the standards were too rigid, uh, then that wouldn't allow the businesses to accurately reflect their uh, financials. But if they're too flexible, there's uh, incentive or perhaps it opens the door to management to uh, uh, manipulate those numbers. So um, it's important to do a risk evaluation to uh, make sure that uh, management is fairly representing their uh, statements. Um, the example that was given in our article is the uh, evaluation of non-current assets. Um, as we know, larger accounts typically have a higher potential for risk and uh, making sure that these numbers are accurately reflected is very important because uh, the non-current assets are depreciated, so that has a direct impact on the income statement and the net income of that company. So it's important to make sure that those initial numbers are accurately uh, reflected. Um, one of the examples of that, that we actually, for our research paper, we'll be mentioning it, is uh, fair value assessment for uh, 
level three assets, which are basically like uh, assumptions based on management's, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, values based on management assumptions. So uh, there's some flexibility with that. And uh, an accountant needs to make sure that that's accurately reflected. The uh, businesses have more knowledge than the auditor typically about how those numbers are reflected. So um, especially in the cases with an experienced auditor, they're more likely to say, um, like to basically defer to the expert, which in this case is management. So there's a, a, a potential for them to verify, but not to evaluate the fairness of that measurement. Um, in play, bringing a key risk indicator into place, like uh, we're all talking about, would normalize this and uh, connect it to industry norms. So basically, it would take the guesswork out of this and allow for the uh, financial statements to be more accurately reflected. Uh, and also, as Hugh uh, Shibe and Ivy mentioned, the KRIs can be put into place to uh, notify the auditor when there's issues, and then the auditor can take steps to uh, make changes and uh, change that evaluation to fix it so it's more accurately reflected in the financials. So it uh, really improves the timeliness, and rather than uh, finding a mistake too late, uh, it can be found on time to be able to uh, be corrected by the auditors. Uh, any, uh, any questions? And it's kind of apropos because I'm going to be talking about enterprise risk management and KRIs today. So, any questions for the group here? Anything that hits you or that you read? Or you, even the groups that are already presented are reading all of the all of the summaries. Anybody anything to comment on? I just want to say that was great, and I really appreciate you stepping out of your comfort zone and <laughs> saying I'm going to present and I'm not going to read it. And you all did a great job, and, and and you know it's just so much more interesting, and it tells me that you understand the content here too. And you're not just reading something off a piece of paper. So that 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 is that that that's going to go so far for you in your career, as much as anything you're learning about accounting. So even though it makes you nervous and you. Just go out and do it. You guys did so confidently. I really, really appreciate that. that, that that's great. You guys are going to be running the firms and the companies you go to work for. So, um, a couple of comments. Uh, just uh, interesting KRIs. I had the opportunity to spend some time with some a best practice group out of New York that we met in New York usually. And we included Siemens and uh, GE, who's actually a competitor, and IBM and uh, PepsiCo and some other large companies. Uh, and we talked about you know the risk management process. We didn't share our risk with one another. And it was interesting how some of the companies have some pretty elaborate analytics that they use to uh, monitor uh, KRIs. And this is an aspect of really auditing and risk management. And auditing, remember, is a part of risk management that's really important. So uh, you know, one of the companies has like 81 analytics that are strategic, operational, financial, and compliance that they run every day and they monitor and look for things that happen that competitors do or that the market does that reach some type of trigger point. And if it reaches that trigger point, it sends an alert and tells them to change the way they do something. Others, for example, in GE, they do things like they say, you know, we have an agreement on what our risk appetite is. Everybody has an a risk appetite. You all have a risk appetite. GE has a risk appetite. Siemens has a risk appetite. And if anything, and, and they try and quantify that a little bit and put a parameter on it. So for example, G said at one point, and I don't know if this is still true, but they said, you know, we will not go into any business regardless of the return if it leaves in the medical field, if it leaves something in the body. So we won't uh, do, you know, uh, uh, artificial hearts or other things just because the risk there is too high. Now they may have changed that, I don't know. But, but, and that's really clear for people doing business development to say, you know, this is outside of our risk appetite. This is outside of our, and I think about in my own life, you know, I'm kind of a risk taker. My wife is very risk averse, you know, and so we kind of meet in the middle on that, you know, but, but uh, everyone has a different risk appetite. And you put a bunch of uh, senior executives in a room in a strategy meeting and we're deciding what businesses are we going to go into. You want to understand what is the risk appetite for my company 
not for this group of people, because I might have a bunch of you know skydiving uh, risk takers in the room deciding on what risks our company is going to take, and that's not representative of the risk of the company. And so a lot of times you need to get clear about what is the risk appetite of my company. And to say we don't take any risks is not an option, because if you don't take any risks, you'll never uh, do anything in life or in business. You know, and business is about taking risks. Yeah. Going like what you just said yeah. about we kind of have to take risks, but in accounting, where is like the an auditing? Where's like the line? Because I feel like you can't take any risks when you're auditing. Mm -hmm. you know well, I mean? yeah, that's a that's a great question. Where where is the line? You know, what 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 is the line? Anybody answer that question? It's the amount. Yeah, materiality. Materiality is the risk. You know, what's the you know? I'd argue this though, accounting is, and that's part of the resistance to analytics and real-time reporting, is accounting is more of an art than a science. And it has a huge risk part. You know, I take risks every day in accounting in the way I'm gonna uh, recognize revenue, or in the way I'm gonna uh, you know, pre present my financial statements, both structured data and unstructured data. You know, I'm, 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 I'm playing a game, right? Same with tax, right? In tax, we had risks, uh, used to put on our risk registers uh, at Siemens, you know, our tax uh, uh, litigation with uh, the IRS. Hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. But, you know, that goes on in every company because taxes are on our, you know. And so you argue this and the IRS argues that. And for three years, you, you have to save all your information. And sooner or later, someone comes out with a gray area agreement and you sign an agreement and then you pay something or they give you money back, you know. And so so I think I think there's a lot of risk because accounting is very much an art, not not so much a science as we think it is. And that's part of the reason that the, nobody wants or some people don't want analytics and they don't want you know, empirical, uh, you know, real time reporting or visible reporting out on a blockchain for everyone to see because I, I want to be able to, you know, spin spin my story a little when I present my financial results and I wanna you know, make assumptions, and I want to play with provisions, and I want to do other things. So that, that that's a that's a great question, though. You know. But absolutely, there's a and some companies are way more risky. Banks are going to be more conservative than startup uh, fintech companies in terms of taking risks. Yep. I have a question. So sure. That's it. Uh, I just say it, it said uh, that here um, that key risk indicators and mm -hmm. one of the monitor they. If they um, identify uh, operational uh, risk process, so that's um, probably that's have some limit. Right? So that who's going to be that every time they uh, identify that kind of risk, have to adjust the system or how who's going to handle that? You that's mean when a KRI indicates there's a risk happening? Right? Yes, yeah. so how that in the process, um, yeah. operational risk and then environmental so outside. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, the risk would trigger some type of action. So we had what we called risk response. I'm going to talk about this in the lecture, but we had risk response plans. So if something goes out of that tolerance, then we're going to we're going to trigger an action, and that might be a review of our competitive position, or it might be changing a provision, or it might be some other uh, you know some some action that we're going to take based on that response. And I'll tell you, a great example of where risk management wasn't done well and a company went out of business over it is Kodak. Everyone know what Kodak is? Right. Well, Kodak had a very good risk management process, and they were the initial inventors of, uh, of digital photography, you know, from, from uh, radio photography, film photography, and digital photography. But they thought that the adoption of uh, digital photography was going to be a linear relationship. In other words, it was going to happen over time. But like most disruptive innovations like blockchain and other things, it's usually a hockey stick adoption. So nothing happens for a while and then suddenly, boom, everyone's on the internet. Everyone's using blockchain. Everyone's using digital film. And because they weren't monitoring, they had great management. They have a great company. They even, they even helped invent it. And they had a good risk management process but they weren't monitoring their strategic risk. They might have been closing their books in a fantastic, perfect way every time, but they weren't monitoring their risk management. And you know what happened? They missed the boat, and they filed bankruptcy. 
you know, and they were they were the inventors of it. So that's why this stuff is just as important, you know, enterprise risk management is just as important as you know doing closing your books right and matching your debits and credits and all that. Because you can miss you miss strategic things, and it won't matter how well you're doing your 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 accounting. And I want you guys to see that perspective, because when we talk about audit in this class, and, and even in the firms, on the advisory side, we're doing all kinds of stuff. You know, most, in fact, most firms, I'm, I was at the AICPA yesterday, meeting with uh, their lead group, uh, their uh, AICPA.com, and they were saying most accounting firms, most of their revenue does not come from audit. It comes from uh, the, a lot of the advisory and consulting stuff, and, and that we're doing, we're doing risk management things around operational, strategic, uh, compliance type projects. So, okay. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. So, is there another way to look at risk and accounting? Is uh, managing your relationship with the client and covering like the insurance aspect? Like, if you put a wrong piece of information out there, it hurts your reputation. Oh. So, it's, it's, it's like a balance of that. That's another yeah. Thing to look at it too. Absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the one of the biggest risks in the world is. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know what conflict minerals are, but you know, conflict minerals are where uh, there's human rights abuses in the Congo and other places because we're using gold and uh, palladium and tin that comes from other countries, the countries that abuse people's human rights. And you know, you may unknowingly be using uh, you know gold that came from you're buying it from some supplier that's not from a certified mine in the Congo somewhere. And 12 people show up in Washington, D.C. at your main office with signs saying that your company is abusing human rights, and suddenly you're, you're out of business, you know, <laughs> or you could have a serious problem, reputational problem, you know. And, 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 and if we don't manage those kinds of things, she mentioned uh, black swans too. Black swans are those big things, you know, you have a, you have a probability. Uh, uh, you have a uh, probability and likely, like, likeliness and impact and risk, and you put that on a heat map. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And uh, you know, but and you, you should focus on the things that have high probability and high risk, right? But the black swans are the things that happen that you that that come out of nowhere. And think about the things that have happened in our economy in the last 10 years. You know, the Enron, WorldCom, you know, accounting and uh, scandals. They were black swans. No one saw that coming. The uh, real estate uh, boom, the real estate bubble. Okay, that was a that was kind of a black swan. We just thought it was going to keep going up. The financial collapse of 2007. We have all these brilliant people that told you how to invest your money in high tech stocks and other things. And by the way, they're still the same brilliant people that are telling you what to do today. And they got it totally wrong. They totally missed it. You know, so that was those were black swans. Those were those things that are high impact but very low likelihood. You know? And those are the things we're not managing. And that's why we need analytics in enterprise risk management because we've got to get better at managing not just risks around uh, accounting controls but risks around strategies and operations. Did I answer the question? Yeah. 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 Good, great questions, great stuff to think about. And good job you guys, thanks a lot. Okay. I'm going to spend a little time uh, jumping into uh, enterprise risk management, and I want to share this because, uh, you know, for the reasons I just mentioned, but also because this is uh, a, a key part. This is the overall thing that a company does in order to come up with how they're going to do their audit. Okay? So uh, let's just spend a few minutes talking about this. Uh, I actually have a lot of slides here, but I'm not, I'm not going to cover up. And what I want to do is I want to give you an overview of the internal control process. I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about what we at Siemens did, how we handled this. And we had a real motivation to do it in a, in a very structured, very best practice way. And that motivation, uh, I'm going to skip that, but we'll talk about what enterprise risk management is and internal control. So it's going to have your clicker, so we're not going to worry about that now. So uh, back in 2008, uh, the Department of Justice and the SEC gave the largest fine at that time that was ever given to Siemens Corporation. And uh, it was because of doing, uh, I, I shared this before, but uh, it was because of bribery or corruption, which we learned in our last class is one of the key areas of risk management is, uh, is, is uh, corruption. And uh, 
Uh, as a result of that, hundreds of people lost their jobs. You saw one of the guys in the video last time on the fraud talk about the pressure he felt. And uh, the company paid a $1.6 billion fine, $800 million to the SEC and DOJ, and $800 million to uh, German regulators that got involved. And then probably spent billions more doing remediation and building a best-in-class risk management and auditing process. And I had the opportunity to be a part of that. It wasn't a fun thing because you know, it was a result of a sad, it would have been great if it was uh, taken on our own initiative, but it was a result of a, a serious issue. And uh, from that, the, the CEO at the time, Peter Losher, said, you know, compliance uh, as part of his, part, his number one priority in corporate America. And you know, you kind of have a pendulum swing when, when you have the Enron and the WorldCom things happen and these kind of things happen. Everybody's all over compliance and then when things don't happen for a little while, the pendulum swings back and it's, you know, take risks and do, do, do your thing, you know. So, so this is a, a, a view of how we do risk in a company. And, and in any company or in your personal life, you have your gross risk, okay? That's any risks that are out there, right? Then you put in your internal control process. That's the Sarbanes-Oxley and the controls that you use, okay? That gets you down to your net risk, okay? Those are the things that you have some control on in your company. Then you get down, you use ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, at, uh, in order to address those risks that aren't controlled by your uh, control environment. And that's where we start to look at things like strategies and operational things and uh, you know, conflict minerals and greenwashing. What what could go wrong in my company? You know, what uh, you know, Kodak's issue of uh, you know, digital film. Where's that going? I better be on top of it, right? And then to respond, and then you create responses. And sometimes the responses are we're gonna uh, uh, we're gonna accept the risk, just say that's just a part of doing business, and it is, and we're not gonna do anything. Sometimes we insure against it, and that's why in a lot of financial companies, when you hear the word risk management, do you know what they're talking about? Insurance. What's our risk management process? Is an insurance process, so we're going to insure against it. We're going to get director's insurance, so if our directors do anything wrong and we get sued, we can pay the bill. We're going to get insurance for, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, you can get travel insurance today. You know, you, you have to cancel your flight because of some reason, the insurance will pay for it, so you, you insure against it. Uh, or, or we try and reduce it in some way by putting in response plans, okay? And uh, this all comes from the COSO cube here, which is the, uh, from the Treadway Commission, which is the group that kind of helps to define auditing and risk management part. And then remember, so auditing is, is one part of it. It's, it's, it's this piece here. But risk management is bigger than just auditing. It's all of these things. So what we did at Siemens is we decided that just like you have an attestation from public accountants, we're going to have what we call an in-control statement. And we're going to make every department, because of this tragedy that happened, we're going to make every company and every leader in every, every division of Siemens is going to sign you know, an in-control statement that's going to say that to the best of my knowledge, uh, you know, everything is hunky-dory in my uh, area and, and, and we have mitigated risks and we have internal controls in place and we're doing all the right stuff, right? And so that, that, that was, and that's pretty radical because most companies don't do that. They, they get an attestation from their external auditors or, 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 or the CEO might need to say something like this, but every division, the CEO of the company said, I, I, in a, in a hundred billion dollar company, I don't know that everyone's doing the right thing, so I want you to personally tell me that you're doing the right thing or, or we're not going to do it, you know. And so they had, uh, you know, they had, and, and, and this all, you know, uh, was, was uh, you know, started at the lowest levels of the company and came up to the top. I had to sign them. I was the risk officer, so I had to review all these and sign on these. And I felt a lot of pressure because if I sign off on these things and then something happens, Someone's going to say, where was risk management? Where was Rod when this was going on? You know, and, and I felt a, a sense of being liable for the first time in the company, you know, not to just say, oh, well, it wasn't my fault. It was those other guys that did that. So, 
And so what they did is they created a supervisory board. And again, this is best practice. I'm not here to tell you every company's doing this, but we learned a very hard lesson through it and, and came up with some best practices. So Siemens went out and they had the audit committee, the back managing board, they had their risk and internal control group, and they had all corporate sectors across the world in all different languages. Interestingly, the fine that they got was not for the bribery itself, and I shared last time that it was it was done through intermediaries where someone comes in and says, you know, hey, we need this contract in Venezuela somewhere, and uh, some consulting firm said, well, we work, we, we're, we're a sales promotional group, and we will help you get this contract for a power generation station or something. And, and so we said, okay, great, what's that cost? And they said, huh. I don't know, six million dollars. I'm just making numbers up here, but six million dollars. And so uh, Jose goes in and comes back with a contract for this thing. And here you go, Siemens. We paid six million dollars, and we, and we say thank you. But what what happens is because we can't itemize the value that he provided over it might have been over three months or a year or, or six weeks, we can't itemize the value. Then you're still liable, even though you didn't pay the money to the the government agency. And that's what the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act only about bribing government officials. But we're still liable because we can't itemize that we paid six million dollars to Jose. And Jose, you know, uh, came back with a contract. We don't we, we, we can't say he you know had these hotel expenses and he did this, this, and this. He just got a contract. But he 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 bribed something. And but the interesting thing is we didn't get the fine for the books and records because you can't trace the money in the world. You know, you, you say follow the money. But once you get into uh, tax havens in the Bahamas and Geneva and other places, the money dries up and we can't follow it anymore. So we got it because we didn't have an integrated, sustainable, documented internal control process. We had lots of people doing lots of things all over the world with different audit programs and stuff. And this is another reason why we got to centralize the audit process and automate it because you're going to get a fine for not having an integrated uh, uh, documented internal control process, not just, and you might have a good one. We did some great things, you know, in different countries all over the world, but we weren't integrated. We didn't have a, a risk management process. So that's why we got the fines, okay? So how do you do this? How does the process work? Well, you gotta start with, you only have risks relative to your objectives, okay? So every company has some objectives, and I just made some examples up here. So growth, people, reputation, cost, services. And when a company has it, you ought to go and you'll go to work for a company, you say, tell me what your key goals, strategies, and objectives are. And if they can't tell you on five or at the most seven fingers, then forget it, you know, because if you have a strategy that's 45 pages, uh, double space, and, and uh, or single space, and on both sides of the pages, you know, it, it's not gonna work. But these are things that you can rally around. And now my entire control environment should fit into these five things. That way I can, I can be clear about what, I, what it is I'm controlling and what we're trying to do. So you'll only have risks relative to your objectives. And you should link your risks to your objectives, okay? All right, uh, I'm gonna just skip the questions here. Okay, and now I said earlier that auditing is not just about financial auditing. A lot of you are in this program and in what you're going to do in your jobs, you're focused on tax or you're focused on auditing, and you're going to focus on financial auditing. But don't lose sight of the fact that financial auditing is not is only one part of the auditing process. There's also strategy, which are these kinds of things up here, which are you know customer things, uh, the internal control process itself, strategic planning, outsourcing, supply chain. And then you have operational things, which are sales and pricing, product for portfolios, business processes, operational processes in your business. Then you have all the financial stuff, foreign currency, cash management, financial statement audits, all that kind of thing. And then you have compliance. And we define at Siemens compliance as regulatory compliance, whether it's the FDA, uh, the, uh, the, the um, financial accounting, Board, it's PCAOB, where, where, anybody who's requiring us to do something. It could be engineering spec requirements. It could be uh, OSHA safety requirements. Anything that's compliance. And those things are just important because as I shared earlier, you screw up in one of them and it's not going to matter 
you know, what, what, what you're doing in your accounting. Or you miss, like Kodak did, you miss a strategy and it's not going to matter uh, how good your accounting or your risk management is in accounting. And as you guys get into the firms, if you go over from auditing into advisory, you're going to work in a lot of these areas. You know, we have the big four, for example, and many of the smaller midterm firms doing all kinds of consulting for us on things that have nothing to do with accounting. They're about supply chain, they're about business processes. So, so, and, and our contention was if we couldn't, if we did anything at Siemens that didn't fit into one of these categories, then uh, we need to, uh, we need to either add a category or we shouldn't build any controls or, or stuff around it because it's not part of what we, we should be doing or we shouldn't be doing. And, and this is going to be in the deck so you can read what these things are, okay? And I'm asking questions like, can you think of anything that happens in an organization that would not fall under one of these categories? And, uh, you know, address some automated controls which would address strategic or operational things. And that's an example I shared earlier. I could have analytics that say, you know, if my competitors, you know, make a purchase, and this could be big data analytics or even social media analytics, if my competitors, you know, uh, make an acquisition in a company, you know, with this kind of stats, let me know that. Or if uh, I, I, I see a growth trend or something on the uh, financial statements uh, from a competitor that show some type of debt ratio, debt, debt to equity ratio, or any ratio that is concerning to me that gives me an indication that they're expanding or they're, they're moving into a new territory, let me know that. Those are great things to automate and put in analytics on things that are not financial statements. Thank you for standing. That's good. <laughs> he, he learned something in the uh, he learned something in the energy management thing. So <laughs> I talked about it. You burn five times the calories, and your cognitive abilities increase significantly when you're standing and moving around. Instead of so, feel free to stand up. Anyway. You don't have to. It's not part of your grade. Okay, so, uh, so what we did is, uh, in the, in the uh, risk process, we came up with uh, these categories and we made like the Bible of uh, policy and control uh, master data. And we had this in control statement. And what we, what we did was, uh, uh, in the SOA process, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk briefly about the SOA process, which you should already know, but it's a little uh, read down. We made a book up and said, this is the controls that we're going to have in this company. And it doesn't matter if you're in Zimbabwe or you're in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, you're going to use the same control mechanism. And, and a lot of them may not apply to you because they may have to do with foreign issues or something that don't apply to you. But we're going to have the same Bible and the same controls so that we have a consistent, repeatable, sustainable, documented internal control process. Okay. That was the outcome of this finding. We said, and, and what's interesting about it is it was a much more efficient process too because now everyone's clear on what the controls are. We're not duplicating controls and we're able to automate controls because everyone's doing uh, you know, uh, warranty accruals the same way because this is, how you, this is the control for a warranty accrual. So, we're able, so, so this is a good idea in any company, whether you're a large company or a small company. Now, everyone knows, I hope, and this is uh, stuff that's covered on the CPA exam too. So, but the the top-down approach that's used in the SOA methodology, the Sarbanes-Oxley signed in 2002 by President Bush, that has uh, cost billions of dollars. And there's some question of how effective it's been, but it definitely puts some emphasis or, or uh, on internal control. And the way it works is simply, you know, we start with uh, significant accounts. Okay, so accounts payable is a significant account, and we use measures like if it's more than X million, uh, million dollars in the account, it's a significant account. Or if it has uh, X amount of dollars moving through the account over a year, then it's a significant account. All right? Then we, uh, we uh, look at uh, different locations, and then we look at what are the processes that that account is impacted by. You know, what are the, the, the processes and the information systems that that account is in. Uh, uh, is in uh, impacted by. And then we say, we ask the traditional, traditional audit question, what could go wrong? How could someone do something uh, in these processes to somehow steal money or uh, perpetrate or conceal a fraud? Right? And then we identify key controls uh, that are going to address those accounts and, 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 and provide security. That's how we build, we call it the top-down approach. Right? And, 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 and
and it, it has variations on it. But that's what we do. That's how we build a control environment. Now, there's some problems with that, though. Can anyone think of what one of the problems might be if I'm going to take any account that has more than $15 million in it or has had more than $50 million transferred through it throughout the year? Uh, and I'm going to pick the processes that affect that at those accounts, and I'm going to build my control environment around them, and then I'm going to go out and sample or test those controls. What, what's the problem with that? What gets missed, maybe? I'm, I'm taking only accounts that have $15 million. $15 million. I mean, what happens? Yeah. An account for $49 million? Yeah. We may not look at it. We may say that. Now, sometimes we do what's called wild cards. We pick some out at random that are smaller, but, you know, and what do you think a fraudster that's an accountant is going to do? Yeah, they're going to say, hey, you know, I know they're not looking at accounts that are more than 15 million, so I'm going to go to this petty cash account and I'm going to steal money there. Because I, I you know, and, and, and what's, what's so ironic about what we've talked about in this class is that we're picking accounts with 15 million dollars. I'm just making a number up, but it depends on the company. It might be $500 in a small company, but it doesn't matter. And we're doing control reviews, and then we're doing sample-based control reviews on top of that. So I have accounts payable with hundreds of thousands of transactions and I'm taking an N equals 30 size sample and I'm doing, I'm, I'm, that's what that's my control. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's ludicrous. And, and again, fraudsters aren't stupid. They know you're not looking at uh, petty cash. So petty cash is what I'm going to hit, you know, or, 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 or some other account. So, so, so that, that, that's the, you know, the, 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 the and how could automation affect that? I can have a control that says monitor every transaction coming out of petty cash or any or, or all accounts all the time. And now if I'm a fraudster, I'm an idiot if I go in and try and steal from any account. So we can do it manually for significant accounts. Why can't we do it for any account? You know, and use analytics to do it. Um, and then uh, in SOA, we also have uh, different types of controls. We, uh, and, and by the way, so you're clear, uh, uh, IT type controls are part of the SOA requirement, and especially IT general controls. And those are that the change management process, because now people are stealing money electronically. They're not doing it uh, you know, by, by you know, necessarily stealing assets, although that still happens. So you have uh, IT controls at a company level, which are organization governance, IT general controls, which are change management, systems uh, development, uh, data center, uh, is the data center secure, and our, uh, our uh, uh, security access to the system secure. And then you have IT application controls, which are automated controls, and there are things in an IT system like duplicate invoice checks in SAP. So if it ever sees a duplicate invoice check, it sends an alert out immediately. They already have a lot of those, those are called application controls. And then you have manual IT dependent controls, which say I'm going to data mine and produce a report, and then you're going to need to look at the report and tell me if there's something wrong in that report. Okay. So, um, so the uh, what we did with our internal control process is we started out with we had all kinds of corporate circulars and uh, SOA requirements and uh, ICS requirements and all these things, and we had thousands of them all over the company, and everyone had different ones, and every country had different ones. So we started a harmonization process, and it was interesting. We found that. Even though the biggest risk is in strategy and operations, you know, operations had a lot of controls, finance at 32%, compliance 17, 7%, and strategy 17%. And then we harmonized those into, a, uh, into this book, this uh, policy control master book. And we reduced the number of corporate circulars because some of them actually uh, you know, uh, refuted each other. And, and we did this sort of sausage slicing to get down to what are the real critical controls that a company, a $100 billion company like Siemens has, and, and that, that apply across all organizations, or could apply across all organizations in all countries. And it was fascinating to see how you know, the problems you have in Zimbabwe are no different than the problems you have in Cincinnati. You know, they're, they're the same kind of, we got people doing things that you know, might be doing something wrong. We have risks that are similar. You know, there might be cultural risks that are a little different, but at the end of the day, you know, risk risk is risk, you know, and, 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 and. and so then we, we did a lot of harmonization and we came up with a review procedure for our control environment. So, 
And, and everyone, you, you guys know, when you go into the firms, they're going to do things like say, uh, you know, we're just going to do on this one a review of the control. Okay? Others are going to say, but on these controls, we want you to re-perform the, 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 the test. So you're going to, even though management, we're going to rely on, for lower risk things, we're going to rely on management testing. For higher risk things, we're going to, we're going to go out and test it ourselves, and we're going to re-perform the control. Okay? And, and so, and you do that based on whether it's a high, medium, or low uh, risk in, with, with the control. So we have this thing which uh, we call uh, uh, DA, which is a detailed assessment. Another is a self-assessment. That's where I come to you and say, a detailed assessment is what you're going to do when, in the accounting firms. You're going to go out and you're going to be the independent tester and you're going to go out and test what the company already said they were doing. And most of the time, you're holding the company accountable for what they said they were going to do in their control process, unless you think it's inadequate. A self-assessment is where I come to you and I say, I'd like you to document the process that you're doing and, uh, and assure once a year that it's correct and, and, and someone couldn't commit a fraud. It's kind of a trusted relationship for lower risk things. And then there were other things that we just said, we just like you to have a control in place for this item. And, uh, and we may, on a spot check, come in and ask you to show us what you're doing. And you need to be prepared to show us that. And that's for the lowest risk thing. So no, no detailed uh, assessment, no specific assessment required. So, and this, this again is not necessarily every company's methodology, but it's a methodology we used at Siemens in order to respond and make sure that that 1.6 billion fine never happened again. And that was the, the motivation for it. And it's a great process, and it really worked really well. I mean, we, we, you know, I could pick up the phone, and I often did, and talk to, you know, my counterparts in South America or in China, and say, you know, how are you doing on this? What are you seeing at this control? And we're all talking the same language. And it didn't matter that we were in different countries. And we got together once a quarter or so and talked about what was working and what wasn't working and unique things. So the self-assessment, I'm, I'm going to skip some of these because I have a lot to cover and I want to get to the ERM piece, but you know, the self-assessment is you know, what activities did you do and how do you do it and you document that. And that's really a trusted uh, review that forces you to kind of think through what am I doing and is it, is it in control and could someone do something wrong. And this is just an example of what an accounts receivable self-assessment like, might, might, might look like. The detailed assessment is much more like what you guys are going to have on your CPA exam and what the public accounting firms do on a regular basis. And that is that you know, we do two things. Remember TOD and TOE. The test of design is a test to look at the control and make sure that the control and the process are actually addressing the risks that you identified uh, and, and that, they're, uh, uh, that the control was designed properly. And every year, the, the, the uh, external accounts come in and they say, have there been changes in your process? Because a change in a process means you've got to redesign a control environment. And that's one of the weaknesses is people don't bother redesigning the control department, the, the control design, even though things change in the business. And so then you're spending all this time monitoring controls that uh, you know, aren't doing anything because you're not doing the same process. And if you fail the test of design in this diagram, then you go, then never mind doing the test of effectiveness. The test of effectiveness is the control, or was the control operating effectively? Even if it was designed right, was it in there and were people actually doing it? Okay. And with, uh, with continuous auditing and monitoring, what we're going to do is we're going we're to look at the test of effectiveness and monitor effectiveness by using technology. But think about this, the design still has to be done. We were talking, Jenki and others earlier, about smart contracts, okay? The test of design of a smart contract is, is this contract designed properly to perform the function it's supposed to perform in a safe way? Uh, and and you know, if it's not, then there's no reason to put it in in the first place. And that, that's kind of the test of design. So in, in continuous auditing, in blockchain technology, we're still going to do test of design because we're still going to have to make sure that things are, are designed properly and are effective. But test of effectiveness, which is the labor intensive part of design, is an annual review usually or a review at a time when a, when a process changes. You know, but uh, the test of effectiveness is what we, we do with the sample, and that's what we want to get away from. So, okay? I have some examples of what that looks like, but I'm not going to go into them right now. I don't want to 
so. Uh, so uh, lots of opportunities. So let's talk about what the team presented on, on enterprise risk management. And I'm a passionate advocate of enterprise risk management because I think if that's done well, uh, then you have a huge opportunity to change the, the, the risk environment in the company and to improve your control environment and to prevent fraud and other things. Um, there, uh, and, and, and some of the tools that you're working with, like uh, the Talk Walker, the um, IBM Watson, those are tools that really address this part of it, not so much the accounts payable audit. You, know, you can't go out to Talk Walker and, 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 well, you could actually, if you have an API to the accounts payable data, you could bring that in. But this is what uh, these tools are really valuable for, and this is where risk should start. It should start at the enterprise level and then determine control. So I can use technology like Talk Walker and Watson and other big data type applications to uh, address enterprise risk management. Um, remind me, I wanted to show you guys a report. I don't have it up here on the screen right now, but I have it on my computer here, uh, where we got a report from a company called Rec Risk, and we were fascinated. It looks just like Talk Walker, which you guys are doing with Talk Walker. We were just fascinated to see Siemens compared uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a packet of other competitors and how risky we were relative to them, and it was all done with big data analytics across print media, internet media, social media, and, and the accuracy of that was so good that it changed our whole perspective on risk management that that's the way we ought to get this stuff, not doing surveys and things, or not doing as many surveys. So, so um, uh, I'm gonna show you this, uh, I'm gonna pull it up here, let me see how I'm doing that time here. Um, this is a, just a funny little video, let me see if it's gonna play here. This is, uh... We found a way to eliminate risk entirely from our projects. Lead Crystal, custom engineer. Name a project we're building. McChesney Office Complex. In February, a little crane accident. Shuts us down for eight days. Cooper Smith. We've got cost overruns in March from a global spike in steel prices. In April, credit markets freeze up. We'll have two subcontractors going under. Was this expensive? activities part that you guys are 
you know, you're going to be testing when you go out into the park, information and communications, and monitoring. It doesn't specifically, and notice the categories that we use in Siemens, it's over strategic operational compliance, uh, and they call it reporting or finance. And then uh, it's, it affects the whole company. So you don't just go in and audit the main office, you audit the whole thing. And this is the control environment best practice model that people use. But when you so talk about risk management, this is all the aspects of risk management or auditing that, that needs to be considered. We did the same thing with risk management. We said if we didn't have a control that was linked to a con an objective, or we didn't have a risk that was linked to an objective, it's probably not a risk in our company. And then we ask ourselves, you know, how is this risk going to affect growth in our company? How is it going to affect uh, developing leaders? How is it going to affect recognition? How is it going to affect optimization of structure? We use the same model here to go through that we used in the control environment to go look at what risks are. And we uh, uh, came up with ideas. We use uh, outside sources that do a great job on identifying what current risks are. I used to love to get these reports, and this was my favorite part of my job: was what, you know, what are what are the risks that are out there? And this is kind of a, a, a heat map, okay? And it put, looks at likelihood and impact. And remember, I said the black swans are the things that have a, a high impact but a low likelihood out here somewhere. And this is from the March report from the. Uh, Corporate Executive Bar for its Risk Council, and they're identifying things in here at that time that were risks. So uh, there was this concern about talent risks, about commodity prices, because commodity prices back in March of 2011 were really low, increased competitive pressure, inflation, M&A, liquidity, fraud, uh, continued recessionary pressures, and and uh, someone said this today. Daniel Sharp from Harvard said, you know. This idea about black swans. The idea of risk management is not to predict catastrophes. And, and I recommend, and we did this at Siemens, that when you do risk management, don't just talk about risks, but talk about opportunities. So if I have, if, some, if my competitors are doing something or we're expecting some type of global thing to happen, what is, how is that going to, how could that help my business as opposed to hurt my business? When Y2K happened, I was in a war room in the year 2000. Uh, you guys were probably all in uh, grade school then. <laughs> and uh, I was in a war room through the night because we were waiting to see what was going to happen with the code issues, date routines and stuff, and, 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 and I was with a company called Armstrong at that point. And we had contingency plans because we thought the biggest problems with COBOL and uh, other programs was going to be in, uh, in the Russia area because they hadn't done a lot of remediation and they had older type programs. And we had a business plan ready to go to take business away from Russia if they had a crash. So that's this idea of contingency planning, and and, and, and you know. But what they, what he, Daniel Sharp was talking about is, you know, don't try and predict catastrophes. Also predict opportunities, and also uh, look at trends. Don't try and say the market's going to crash. The you know, if someone would have said the world economic collapse is going to be in you know September of 2007. People would say, "Get out of here." But if you said, "You know, look at this bubble that's happening in real estate. Look at this bubble that's happening in securities. Look at this bubble that's happening, uh, you know, with certain instruments that are very risky." And 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 that is growing and growing and growing. This trend is happening, so we need to mitigate the trend, not predict the disaster. And that's that's and, that, and 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 now today with BI business intelligence AI I can predict you know pretty accurately I can see trends really clearly and where they're heading and ultimately you, there may be not denial I don't want to admit that something's going to happen or I don't want to be the one crying wolf but you know something's going to happen so you know this this is really helpful to to uh, get that uh, we'll talk about black swans we've kind of covered that. And then what we did is we rated risks, and we did it across with a major significant minor. We did it across five or six things, and these have changed since, but they're basically the same thing. So you have risks against business objectives. The risk that if this risk happens, it's going to affect our growth. It's going to increase our cost. It's going to cause a problem. Or media risks, and this is the example I gave if you're doing conflict minerals and some people come up and get in front of your office with 12 protesters saying your company is abusing human rights, 
you got a real problem, even though uh, you know the dollar value of it may be relatively small, the potential impact of it, of your reputation, would be huge. And remember I talked about in the fraud class, we're not prosecuting fraud people because it's bad press. You know, you don't want to have, you don't want to be, you don't want to admit that we had a, a fraud that went on and, 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 and it's on the front page of the paper and even though Joe Fraud goes to jail for 20 years, your reputation is really hurt because people think fraudsters work at your company. You know, so, so that's that's one of the negative times. And then, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and we, we actually said, you know, it, it's a minor issue if it's just local media coverage. If one plant had some environmental thing and people are making a stink about that, that's one thing. But if it's national media coverage or extensive, persistent national media coverage, then we better have a different response plan, a much more aggressive response plan. And for every one of these risks, we have a response plan. Here's what we're gonna do if this risk is realized. Here's who's gonna be called, here's who the owner of it is, so that when you have that, you know what to do. And that's a big issue today in cybersecurity issues, is having an incident response plan as a requirement of the NIST standard, the National Institute of Standards. So you better know, if you get hacked in your company, what are you going to do? Because if you if you wait to announce it, you can get in serious trouble. If you announce it too soon, you can get in serious trouble. It's, a, it's a, you know it's like recalls with companies. They have to have a, a response plan of what they're going to do if they have a defective uh, you know uh, fuel injector that could cause a car to accelerate on its own. You know what, what are you going to do? And then uh, regulatory bodies uh, management time. If, it, if an issue is just going to consume so much management time, and it's going to be more than 20% of senior management time, meaning that's all they're going to do is talk to the press and talk to people, that raises the, the, the risk score. And what we did is we scored the risk on these five criteria, and we gave it a, and then on a financial criteria. What's going to be the pre-tax uh, uh, you know your EBIT impact of, of 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 this risk. So every risk we took, we, we rated it, you know, a, a five or a six, and based on this criteria. And we'd always take the lead criteria. So the lead criteria could be financial, or it could be reputational, like that conflict minerals one. And in that case, it could it could have just as high a score as a two hundred and fifty, you know, million dollar impact. Okay. And then the other thing we did is we took uh, the likelihood. So what's the likelihood that this is going to happen? Okay, what, what, that, 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 that we're going to realize that. Oh, and, and we also rated opportunities. And in opportunities, we only looked at business objectives and financial. And that's really important because otherwise, risk management becomes kind of the you know the, the doomsday or uh, predictor of disaster, master of disaster. Whereas if you look at opportunities, then you have management's attention. They're saying, oh yeah, we could. Uh, Take away business in Russia if this problem happens. You know, or we could uh, we could we could get more sales if uh, we manage this risk problem. And then we looked at the likelihood, and this is where it gets a little uh, amorphous here. You know that uh, you know, and we just used a one to nine scale, saying you know, or one to ten scale. If there's a ninety percent chance of this happening, then and, and what we did is we took two times the impact plus the likelihood. So if I had an impact back here of a, of a five, okay, because it was a reputational thing, and I take you know uh, uh, I have a ten, and it, and if it had a fifty percent likelihood, then I would have a a, a fifteen, a risk score of fifteen, and then we took that and we rated that on heat maps, and that's what a heat map is. And this is a great concept. You can do it in your personal life. You know, what are your risks? What are your high risks? What are your low risks? What are your medium risks? And, and you show them on a heat map. So the red part here is high impact and high likelihood. The, uh, the orange, the green, and then the green. So where do you focus your biggest effort and response plans are here? But remember I said earlier that uh, you know, where the black swans show up are down here. They're the uh, high impact but very low likelihood. I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, no, they're up here. The black swans are up here. They're the high impact ones, but very low likelihood. You can have this axis either way. And, and, and then we broke them out still by strategic, operational, financial, and compliance risks. So we're looking at all those same areas. And this is following a very you know, systematic, proven kind of methodology. Um, 
and, and, and that's just the impact score again. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about you know why. What are some of the myths and some of the things that happen with uh, with uh, uh, risk appetite? I thought this was a great example. This was done by a company uh, where they took those five objectives: top line growth, profit, operational excellence, reputation, and compliance. And they did a spider diagram, and they said, uh, okay, I'm gonna. They took each risk, and they they map the risk onto here to see how it was going to affect any of these things, okay? And and uh, and and then they actually went through and said, you know, the this is the risk, this is the uh, the tolerance that we have, this is our risk appetite, and this is the trade-offs. So they were actually able to look at all of their risks on how they're going to impact their 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 growth. You know, someone asked before, you know, in accounting, is there any appetite for risk? You know, but think about this: that in anything, even in things like that seem uh, self-evident, like safety or uh, or regulatory compliance, you know, we, we may say, well, we have no or fraud. We have no tolerance for in safety for anything to go wrong. We have zero tolerance in safety. But the reality is, we're going to put in a stop safety program. We're going to spend so much money on it, but we're not going to spend an unlimited amount of. So to some extent, we're going to assume or allow some risk in safety. We're not going to put, you know, bars and gates and and, and domes and everything on everything everyone does. So I, I, even even in something that's, you know, uh, sort of self-evident like safety, I'm, I'm, I assume some level of risk. I face some risk. You guys do every day. You get in your car. You, know, you, you want it. It's dangerous to get in your car. Way more dangerous than getting on an airplane. But you still do it to come to class, right? You're assuming some amount of risk with, with your own safety. Um, so this is just, an, I, again, I'm not going to take the time to go into it in detail, but this is a neat way, I thought it was done by a, a utility company, and I love this idea that, that you tie your risks to your objective very clearly in, in, a, in an empirical way. Uh, and, and, and again, being clear about your risk appetite. If you don't have something like this, you're really not clear about what your appetite for risk is. Because see how these do. If I want top line growth, but I also want profit, what what do you have to do to get top line growth? You got to invest in risky things that might not return a profit or might return a loss. So there's a trade off in the risk. I'm, I'm going to have to, or if I want a perfect reputation, then I'm going to stay away from not just things that are left in the body medically, but I'm going to stay away from anything that's risky. You know, blockchain is risky. You get involved in blockchain, well. Maybe better, or you might be the next Kodak sitting out there. So, so it's it's, it's trade-offs, uh, and even compliance. You know, we're we're going to comply with all laws and regulations. Every company will tell you that. But the way we do that, and the way we integrate with the IRS, and the the, the thing, the the aggressive accounting techniques that we use, and the way we manage provisions, is all assuming some level of risk. If it isn't black and white and clear, how how that works. Um, okay. A couple of myths about risk management is that uh, that financial risk management is the most important part. And you can see from this chart from the corporate executive board that the greatest value loss in companies is not is only seven percent, or I'm sorry, thirteen percent from uh, or fifteen percent from financial risk. The biggest risks you have are if you screw up like Kodak did on strategy or operational things. That's almost 75% of your of your uh, the risk to your company. So again, you can you can do everything well in accounting and dot all the I's, and you're only impacting 15% of the value of your company is is is, going, is at loss or risk. And that's something people need to realize. Even though we spend a lot more time and a lot more focus in risk management and controls and auditing on this 15% piece than we do on all these others combined. But you know that's not where our real challenge and real risk zone is. Okay. Uh, and another one is we're good at risk at sensing because we have invested in enterprise risk management. That's the idea that you know what we found when we compared ourselves with other companies is that we had a state-of-the-art risk management process, best in class, Benchmark world class, but some other companies that we benchmarked against, uh, they used spreadsheets and had you know very uh, uh, crude tools. 
But they had a real risk, risk aware culture. They made all their management men attend a full day session every year on risk management. They, in every meeting, asked about risks, uh, not just project risk, but business risk. So they had a, a, a risk aware culture. And that's, so, so you, can, you can have all the right trimmings in place, but not, not be very good at it sometimes. So, um, we can sense and protect business because we manage risk at, at uh, the unit and the EU level. Okay, and that's this idea of, uh, you know, are, are we managing risks throughout the whole company? Because if all you do is have great risk management up in corporate, and your plant out in, uh, you know, in, in Mexico City somewhere is, uh, you know, just the Wild West doing their own thing, that, 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 that could be a problem. So, um, improvements for ERM are, uh, you know, clear value propositions, clear clarity about the risk appetite, and think about it in your personal life. What's your personal risk appetite? You know, and, and, and how do you mitigate, how do you mitigate risks in your own life? You know, what do you, what do you do? Do you have a kind of a response plan? Do you do things uh, differently? Do you, do you change the way you think about things? And how do you uh, reconcile that with your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend when they say, hey, let's go skydiving? And you say, hey, I'm not going skydiving. It's interesting, before you're married, and then you say, yeah, I'll go skydiving, whatever you want to do, and then afterwards, get out of here, I'm not going skydiving. <laughs> so, uh, so I have some questions.